married, married and uh, and I'm sure that it's taken a lot of preparation to reach this evening, and uh, I'm very, very grateful for it. As I uh, sat uh, tonight, uh, I, I seem to have a sense that there were a fair number of people who are new, new to sit in. Uh, there seemed to be a fair number of people that didn't seem to be here last year. If, if this is, uh, if you're new to Senate, if those who are new to Senate, uh, raise your hands. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, for you and, and maybe for, for some of the folks in the uh, in the uh, in the congregation who, who aren't used to Senate services, uh, at, at the service they usually preach the charge, which is not a sermon. It's not based generally on the, on the readings that we've heard, but on, uh, on the work and the ministry of, of the diocese. So, if you will bear with me. I give you a new commandment, we just heard read, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, one of, of all the things that are expected of a Christian to say our prayers, and to be faithful, to be merciful, to be forgiving, the shorthand that Jesus gives to show everyone, whether members of a community were his disciples, was if they loved one another. We can say our prayers, we can say, perform our liturgy, sing our hymns, but to disciple, to be disciples. In addition, we are to love one another. Now, there are many ways to show love, but in the past number of years, the Anglican Communion throughout the world has chosen to express our love through the marks of mission, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, to teach, baptize, nurture new believers, to respond to human needs by loving service, to seek to transform unjust structures in society, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. And in this charge, I plan to review how we live these marks of mission and suggest ways as to how we might embrace and live them more fully, loving one another and serving God's people. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Our diocese has a long time commitment and a very major investment in the group. With over a half million dollars invested in the buildings and infrastructure at the site, and with a budget last year of just over $125,000. The work of Mint Brook is a commitment to proclaiming the good news to youth and adults alike. Many of the children and some of the adults who take part in Mint Brook programming have just a tenuous relationship with the church and their time at Mint Brook may well be the most important faith event in their schedule. In addition, we have numerous non-church groups who use the camp and while they may have no overtly Christian element in their programming, our ministry of Christian hospitality is itself a proclamation of the good news. We will commit an extended amount of time this Senate to discuss Mintbrook. We see Mintbrook as a very important element in the ministry and work of the diocese, in its ministry to people of all ages. We see it as a place of prayer and learning and meditation, a place to grow and to nurture faith, as well as a place for us to live and model faith to outside groups. And we have to make some major decisions concerning Minbrook at this Synod, and we will ask for your prayerful support and your financial commitment. Our diocese, along with the other two Newfoundland and Labrador dioceses, is a partner in Queen's College, contributing $42,500 directly each year from our diocesan budget. Queen's not only trains people for ordination, it offers numerous programs online and at the college, as well as a diploma in theology and ministry program here at Clarendon. While the diocese sponsors and supports this program, it is also supported by the rector and the St. Mary's Parish, the 
parish makes its facilities available free of charge. And there are presently 13 persons from throughout our diocese as well as from other denominations registered in that program. Now, Queens will not be accepting any new students for the coming year. But my hope and prayer is that when it resumes accepting new students next year, we will be renewed and reinvigorated to train lay and clergy alike for greater and more effective service in the church. On a very optimistic note, Queens is conducting a vocations retreat in a couple of weeks for which 17 persons have registered. As well, I have already one young man in the diocese who's planning to register for Queens next year, and so hopefully uh, there is already a class forming for the 2014 academic year who will be better trained to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. To teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. Recently, we have conducted a survey of our clergy to discern what they would like to cover in clergy conferences and continuing education. The item of highest concern was baptism. Clergy place a very high importance on a need for us to do baptism well. It's not enough to simply offer a convenient liturgy that grandparents deeply desire. There is a profound desire on the part of our clergy to perform baptism with integrity, remaining true to the liturgy, the theology, the purpose of baptism which is to initiate new members and create disciples. Baptism is the basic sacrament of the church, and in baptism, we are each called into covenant relationship, into a relationship with God, represented not by a certificate, but by a life in devotion and service. The sacramental act of baptism is normally a function of the priest, but the most profound teaching and the ongoing nurture of new believers is not that of the priest at baptismal preparation. It is the ongoing life of the congregation expressed most profoundly in our scriptural theme. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In a world of disintegrating communities and broken relationships, the baptismal community, the church, is to be a place of love. We need to test every word we speak, every deed we perform with the question, is this an expression of love by which everyone will know that we are disciples of Jesus? Each parish and congregation must be a welcoming, nurturing place where the gospel is proclaimed in love. And as I travel the diocese, I see so many examples of such nurture. As various ACWs and other church groups present blankets and Bibles and other gifts to the baptized and to confirmants. I see members of congregations visit seniors' homes and individual shut-ins in their own homes. I see clergy visit those unable to attend church to share the good news of the gospel through the continuing care of the church and through the bringing of the sacrament. Clergy continue to visit hospitals regularly, and this is not always easy in all facilities, and it is incredibly important. And this is an important thing. And remember now, as members of Synod, um, you are to go back to your parishes and, and share what you've heard here. And one of the things that you need to share with everyone is that when members of our congregations are admitted to hospitals, that they must express their wish upon admission to be visited by a clergy. If you say, no, don't bother, not today, that means no, your name will never go on that list. And the hospital is not permitted to call the clergy. And so please make it very clear when you or a relative tell the people in your congregations when they are admitted to hospital 
if indeed they want to see a clergy, then they need to say that and say it strongly uh, in order to be visited. The next mark of mission to respond to human need by loving service. Earlier last year, I made an appeal for people in the diocese to contribute a tuning for each motorized vehicle they own so that we could contribute to purchasing a motorcycle uh, for the church in Cuba to spread the gospel and to do ministry in Cuba. And to date, we have collected $6,325.94, for which we are indeed thankful and for which I'm sure the church community in Cuba will be thankful. However, as I reminded you at the time, if you visit Cuba, find an Episcopal church and worship there, your presence in that church will be indeed a response to human need by loving service. Your mere presence will be an inspiration and an encouragement. Last year, our diocese contributed 78,000 $249.72 to Primates World <coughs> Relief and Development. $78,000 in just 32 of our parents. <coughs> it's impossible for us to imagine the food and the water, the medicine, the education that this money provides in Africa and India, indeed all around the world and in our own north. Last year, the Anglican Charitable Foundation for Children uh, the, the local board, the diocesan board, is resident here in Clarenville. They distributed over $25,000 in the central diocese in grants for clothing and education throughout this diocese. Many of our parishes and church groups as well undertook and undertake numerous projects to help run food banks and thrift shops and other social programs as well. Not a day, I think, goes by, but someone in our diocesan family is online calling for prayer, for family, for friends, for community members. The work of our ACWs is astounding, providing dresses for Haiti, cartons of items to help victims of violence get reestablished, hats for cancer patients, shawls, baby tubes, and in the past, a shipment of warm clothing for the North, transported, I might add, free of charge by household movers. I might also add that our dedicated clergy and licensed lay ministers do their part in providing that most basic need of faithful Christians, the need to gather together to worship. I cannot stress how fundamentally important that I believe it is for church, churches to provide well-planned worship with a well-preached sermon, challenging sermons, with prayers which bring the needs of the community and the congregation before God. All of the other needs we meet must be grounded in deep and profound commitment to prayer and <coughs> to worship. The next mark of mission is to seek to transform unjust structures of society. When you visit my office, you will see on one of the walls two items. One is a stole that my mother made for me at my ordination to the diaconate. It uh, is done in a traditional Grenfell pattern with an Inuit person walking toward the cross. My mother was born at Separation Point near Paradise River, likely in a mud floor hut. Her mother died of TB when she was quite young. Her father was a Labrador trapper, unable to care for the children, and so she spent a number of years in Grenfell orphanages in Cartwright and in St. Anthony, where she learned to sew as part of, of her education. But being from the coast of Labrador, she felt hurt and pain and shame when she went to St. John's and was referred to as a schema, even when her marks and her work gave her the right to be the valedictorian of her nursing class at the Grace General Hospital in St. John's in the 1940s. Her work is beautiful, and I look at it often to remember her 
and her righteous indignation when she saw cruelty or injustice or prejudice. As followers of Christ who died for even the people who Christ crucified him, we can never overlook cruelty or injustice or prejudice. Much less so can we be its instruments. Next to the stole is a beaten copper picture of da Vinci's Last Supper. It was made many, many years ago for my father by a prisoner at Dorchester. His family had disowned him and dad had become a mediator between him and his family and helped their reconciliation. These days, it is increasingly acceptable to write off criminals, to be tough on crime, to give criminals the opportunity to create art would be to coddle them. And I look at it often to remind myself that all people can create beauty, that those at the fringes of society need the church, perhaps even more than the church needs them. I remind myself that all persons are the creation of God and that within all people is the breath of God. I remind myself that the church can disown no one. Seeking justice, though, and even knowing what is right is not always easy. Last year, my picture appeared in a local paper when I attended a flag raising marking the beginning of Pride Week in Gander. Now, I'm genuinely sorry that there were people in the church who were upset by me being there. However, I went when I heard a gay person on the radio saying, that it was difficult for her to get a job in Gander or to get an apartment because she was gay. I heard her say that it was frightening walking home at night when people shouted obscenities at her. Now we can debate marrying or ordaining gay persons. Many in the church have deeply divided opinions on scripture, and while the Anglican Diocese, either our diocese of central Newfoundland, has affirmed a traditional stance on issues of sexuality, we can never stand idly by and permit anyone to be the victim of violence. We can never stand idly by in our communities when there are people in our communities living in fear. We can never be so unguarded in our speech from the church as to cause violence or fear. One of the most astonishing things that Jesus did was to stand with people who no one else would stand with. He stood with lepers who had been driven from their communities. He stood with a woman taken in adultery as others tried to stone her. Jesus ate with Gentiles, which is something that the religious authorities of his time would never have done. His religious community and disciples would have despised Samaritans, but he called one good. That would have been shocking to his disciples, and we sometimes miss that when we read the story. As a church, we need to be very careful not to allow ourselves to be led into the prejudices of our age. To strive is the next mark of mission. To strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Now I hesitate to mention this, and I certainly do not wish to offend or embarrass anyone. But one of the things we do as a church without a thought to its ecological consequences is to, use, is to use large amounts of styrofoam in the forms of plates and cups. It doesn't compost. It's quite toxic to the environment. It can be deadly to fish or birds or animals that ingest it, and yet we use it all the time. Sometimes, because of numbers or convenience or circumstance, there's little choice. But it would be very helpful if our church groups experimented with alternatives and let other groups in the diocese know what's working for them. For instance, a number of years ago at the Lambeth Conference, we used flat barren cutlery made of wood fiber and cornstarch products. So there are alternatives. There are many here, there are many here who have been troubled as well 
and suffer for what we've done to our oceans. Except for four of our parishes, the traditional industry of the parishes of our diocese has been the fishery. And it could be argued that those parishes not directly involved on the fishery still benefited from it. Whatever the cause, be it overfishing or climate change or some other cause or combination of causes, our historic <coughs> attitude that Mother Nature can absorb any indignity is an attitude that we all must change. It's important that we care for God's creation, that we be seen as leaders in caring for it. One of the greatest gifts that our forebears have given us in many communities is land. Uh, I hesitate to say that where River Ferry is. <laughs> Not that you could give it some days, but nonetheless. In the Diocese of Western Newfoundland, at St. Mary's in Cowhead, the congregation has over the years created a beautiful prayer garden next to its church. It's a, it's a windswept, barren coast, but a small number of dedicated gardeners have created a wonderful, peaceful, prayerful place where one can sit or stand and enjoy the beauties uh, of God's creation. It's a wonderful illustration of what we might do to involve people in a different form of ministry, both as gardeners who participate with God in creating beauty and as prayerful intercessors who spend time in God's presence planting and nurturing and praying. It's a possible project for some of our churches. Start small and, and build it. In conclusion, there's a saying in the sustainability movement that every dollar we spend is a vote for the world we want to create. I would add that each moment we spend has the same effect. This happened last night, and so I didn't put it in my charge, and of course, many of you have been listening to the news today uh, about the uh, collapse of the factory in Bangladesh and the death of, of many, many people as a result of that. Uh, there's no such thing as cheap clothing. Someone pays. And, uh, and we need to be aware of that. As Christians and as disciples, we are called into a loving relationship with God who gives us a new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this you will know that you are, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you want to love one another. As we continue God's ministry in the Diocese of Central Newfoundland, I invite you to use the marks of mission as a guide and as a touchstone. Let us join the churches of the Anglican Communion around the world in proclaiming good news, in teaching, baptizing, nurturing new believers, in responding to human need by loving service, in seeking to transform unjust structures of society, in striving to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. These marks of mission are used all over the world, not only by Anglicans, but in, in, in other denominations as well. And I urge you to follow up on them and to use them uh, for, for your study, for your thought, for your prayer. This is a wonderful diocese. This is a wonderful collection of loving Christian people seeking to live the life that Christ has called us to live. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege for us to gather in synod to do the work of this diocese. I pray that in the hours to come and tomorrow as we meet, that we will proclaim the good news, that we will live these marks of mission so that God's, so that we bring glory to God and we show that we are his disciples in the love we have for one another. Let us pray. Almighty God, who called your church to witness that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself, help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you 
through him who was lifted up on a cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Faithful witness to his resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord. 